Before I uh, begin, I want to mention too the uh, if people are listening to it this way or find us one way or another through uh, the uh, 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 oh you, no won't come to me the channel where you can uh, pick up the songs and things at the church website and that website is www.cog7.com and uh, that will get you started there. And if you find the phone number on there, I won't give it over over this system, but if you dial that number, you'll get me. <laughs> you'll get our home phone number. So uh, don't be afraid to call. Love to hear from people. And we have heard from one lady in Oklahoma, but about 300 miles away. It's this way and this way and this way and this way. <laughs> it's uh, add that all together. Um, but it's very nice to hear from people that say that they appreciate it or that they've listened or something like that. And it's always a pleasure to know that uh, somebody is getting some good from what's happening here. And really thankful for our brother that does all of the computer work. It's not me, <laughs> uh, but he knows uh, the systems well and is able to operate it and get it, keep it going. So uh, if you uh, want that, uh, uh, more information about it or so, and just contact us or phone us and uh, we can visit with you. Anyway, I've been talking about the red letters of the Bible, only uh, somebody decided that these words that Jesus spoke in the Holy Scriptures and from the King James Version. Mine happens to be a Cambridge from England, and now they're not available anymore, but uh, the uh, King James English was, uh, uh, when it was put together and, and written, um, produced, it was uh, not copyrighted so that we can copy from it or we can talk about it or use it without worry. Some of the other uh, translations are very good, but uh, we have to be careful then how many words you can say and how many, you know, the copyright situation. So we stay with the King James, and we enjoy the King James too. It was uh, always there for so many, many years. So I'll be using the King James Version and uh, speaking that way, and I hope I don't have too much, as they say, uh, um, Christianese, <laughs> speaking a thousand of these. <laughs> but... Uh, um, uh, we enjoy the uh, red letters that somebody put into the scriptures, colored the type, so that they were s supposed to be, and usually are, the words that Jesus used. And then they're in red letters so that we can identify when Jesus is talking to us in black and white print. You, you wouldn't know which is which, but if it's in red, you say, aha, uh -huh, that's Jesus. And it's in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those four Gospels have Jesus speaking. I guess there's a little red in Acts and a little red in some of the others, but uh, the main ones are Matthew, uh, Mark, Luke, and John. So last week we covered uh, some uh, verses, in, mainly in Mark, because I was following a certain pattern and Mark has a certain number that were, was working out for me. And I wanted to kind of do them in the order they're in the Bible, though we know that that's uh, not uh, a special meaning that Matthew was first, so therefore, you know, uh, he's favored. No, it's not that way. We just want to see the difference of how the translators translated Matthew's story about Jesus. And then did that match with Mark? And did that match with Luke? And Luke added something more because he was interviewing people. And so we want to see how those compare. So we are doing some in each book. And last week I, I did uh, the, the rest of the ones that I had for, uh, for the book of Mark. And now I I'm, I'm want to do uh, more in Matthew. We've done some in Matthew. I'm doing some more today. And uh, we'll see how far we can get. And then uh, Luke will be next. And uh, John is interesting in that they don't use the word parables very much, or at almost not at all, the word parable or parables. Uh, but there is a whole chapter in the book of John. So I want to compare these things and, and uh, 
uh, and not, not leave John out. <laughs> In fact, I think it would be really interesting to do John last and uh, really see what he had to say on a lot of things that he was remembering or that he was being inspired by the Holy Spirit to write for our knowledge. And, and uh, we'll see uh, how that matches with the other ones that we've been reading. The Holy Spirit was the one that was guiding these messages so that we would have it. And God was preserving it from generation to generation to generation until here we are and we do have it. So what would we call the sermon? Well, kind of what I've already said, but that's too much to write down. So <laughs> I just called it the stories and parables of Jesus in Matthew continued. I don't know if we need any more than just the parables and stories of Jesus. And uh, you'll remember that they were the red, red letters that I was aiming at. What did Jesus have to say? What did he teach? What was coming from him to us? So uh, if you would take your Bibles and turn with me to Matthew, Matthew chapter 13. And believe it or not, we're going to be taking, what, four big chunks of that chapter <laughs> as our starting point. So turn to Matthew chapter 13. Lots there in red. And I'm going to open two things here. One is my regular Bible. And then, uh, in fact, I'm trying to encourage people to uh, read the Bible all the way through. Uh, it's not that bad. You can do it in less than a year. And uh, as I've told a number of people, that when you take the audio tapes that we used to have, the little cassette tapes, and would count up how many were there and whether they were 45 minutes per tape, it's about three days and three nights, 72 hours. <laughs> Oh, you have to take a break for coffee break, and you have to take a, a break for <laughs> sleep, and you have to take a break for, yeah. So it's going to take more than three days and three nights. But it's pretty easy to finish it in a month if you wanted to. Two months, five months, six months, one year, two years. So if people feel like they're getting out of sequence because they don't do it fast enough, I say, ah, oh, you're just on the two-year plan. Don't worry, just keep going. Okay. <laughs> But it's fairly easy to do it in one year and uh, not go so fast that you don't get the information that's there. The entire Bible in one year. Very interesting. So one more thing here. I'm going to go to my Bible program. It's here, but I'm going to get it into Matthew. There we go. Now get it in Matthew. In chapter 13. So I can read one way or the other here. Uh, the Bible has a little bigger program, a little bigger type si size. Otherwise, then I can get it good. Let's see what I got here. 13. Okay, we'll start with verse 1, though, probably. Be a good idea. Oops, yeah, that way. Okay. Why I'm using both is because in my Bible, I've got lots of extra marks. And it'll tell me whether I'm uh, needing to accent a certain place or talk about a certain thing. And I can see certain words con in, in conjunction with others. And I can tell the story rather than reading it all. Okay? <laughs> it's a little more interesting that way, I think. So Matthew chapter 13. <clears throat> And I'm really aiming first for, uh, uh, just grab them up here. Let's see, 43, 45, 47, 51. But let's go back a little bit here to, uh, I guess 37 is where I'd really like to start. Verse 37. Okay. Okay. Oh, I know why I'm starting that far into the chapter is because we did some of it before and I don't want to redo it, um, though I don't want to neglect any of it. So sometimes he's talking about, Jesus is talking about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. And he talks about the son of man. These are all very valid things that you want to grab up on. So in verse 44, it's talking about the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hidden a field. Um, the, uh, 
the kingdom of heaven, Jesus is trying to explain in picture form, in, in, in speech of picture form, uh, to help us understand what the kingdom of heaven is and to know whether it's uh, this way or that way. He's, ex he's going to be teaching something. And uh, we want to be able to see those things. Well, and parables are, are, are little stories, stories of Jesus, but stories where it's got a different meaning or a double meaning. And the more you learn about this double meaning thing, you can be talking about heaven and you can see it in visual form that we're used to on earth. So if it talks about a treasure in a field, oh, we know what that could be. They say all over this area of the country that we're living in, <laughs> uh, there was some bad guys that would steal from somewhere and bury it or hide it. And it's, a lot of it is not found yet all over Oklahoma. I think the other things that are lost and, and you could find would be something that was picked up with a tornado and dropped somewhere else. They go, whoa, now that could be interesting to see what would be there. So we would know what that means to have a treasure in a field. Well, when this man found this treasure, he, he was so happy about it. You know, I'm going to be rich or I'm going to be this or I'm going to be that. He's happy about it. And he says, uh, I'm going to sell everything I've got so that I can buy that field. And then he'd discover it, you know, that sort of thing. And that's uh, in, at verse 44. And 45, it starts again. The kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man uh, seeking goodly pearls. They'd have to go to other countries. They'd have to go to water. They'd have to have divers and so on. And he's thinking of that, going to do that. And then it says, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had to buy it. Two stories where the people that found what they were after went and sold all that they had in order to obtain that. Now, how do we look at this double meaning? What if this pearl of great price or the treasure hidden in the field was talking about Bible, talking about teachings of Jesus, the teaching of the Bible, the, uh, the value of having the Bible, all those years from, well, 2,000 years, uh, when the Bible was being written and made, uh, the Old Testament, of course, before that, and then it was put into Greek form, which Jesus was reading and the apostles were using to preach by. And it's been brought together. The languages have been brought together. And we have a copy of it. How much value do we put into that? Do we really understand what we've got in our hands? Went all those years and didn't get destroyed and lost. We've got it. How much value do we put in the knowledge of Jesus Christ and the knowledge of salvation, the knowledge of the Heavenly Father? What value can you put on it? It should be worth so much to us that we would give all to have that knowledge. That's what that parable is all about. So verse 47 starts again with the same thing. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea, the gathering of every kind of fish. And when it, when it was uh, full, the net was drawn to shore, and they sat down and they gathered from the vessel, the good and the bad. The bad they threw away. So that at the end of the world, uh, when the angels come forth and sever the wicked from the just, usually people are told the other way around. Watch that. This is a really interesting thought that the wicked are going to be taken away not the other way around. And the, the meek shall inherit the earth, not the wicked. The righteous are going to stay here. There's a verse that says the righteous shall never be removed. We've got to coordinate those verses together and say, okay, I, I'm getting the picture. Verse 50 says, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. Oh, that sounds like the book of Revelations where the bad is going to be burnt up. And there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. That's people. You never hear about a, a fish or, a, you know, some, something else that's gnashing of teeth. It's uh, humans. Why are they gnashing their teeth? Because they missed it. They could have known better. They could have acted differently. They could have done better. Uh, and they missed it. And now they're so uh, angry with themselves, so upset with themselves, 
that they're gnashing teeth even. And then in 51, and Jesus said unto them, have ye understood all these things? And some say, you know, they hear, they say, yea, Lord. But then, did you really get it? That's what the thought is. Otherwise, why would Jesus specifically ask, did you understand these things? He's hoping that people will go deep enough that they get the story, get the idea, get the uh, inflections that were there. So, yeah, when we run across a verse that says that the wicked will be severed from among the just, we got to hang on to that thought and that verse because we'll connect it later with something else. With where are the righteous? Where are the wicked? And even in the parables, it's very easy to connect some more things with those thoughts. So we do need to, we're expected to understand them, in other words, is what, what that means too. And when we read these things, we should understand them. And then the, the next story starts in verse 52. Uh, and he said unto them, Therefore every scribe, somebody is taking notes, <laughs> everyone that's writing and, and writing for others to read as well, which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an, an householder which be, bringeth forth out of his treasures the good things and the old, the new things and the old. So this person that's writing, he's got all these notes put away somewhere, He's got these thoughts, these understandings, these teachings. He's got them somewhere. And out of his treasures of this wealth of information that he's got, he can bring out some of the old things or he can bring out some of the new things and match them up, compare them, and so on. This, this is a good thing if he does it. If he just leaves them hidden in the field or uh, never get found, never get read, never get told, that's not a good thing. So Jesus is expecting people to bring out the, the parables and the thoughts that were presented and to um, tell people, uh, well, there's one verse, the sense of the story. The, the King James uses the word sense. That when the scribe is relating what's in the scripture, they were to give the sense of the story, the sense of what was meant. So parables, uh, Jesus used a lot, and, and uh, there's verses that says that he doesn't, um, at this time, he couldn't teach them anything other than in parables. So you'll hear about animals, you'll hear about fences, and you'll hear about a wolf that was going to come. And, uh, but you have to remember, we're dealing with people. A wolf in sheep's clothing, that's a bad person, not a sheep, not a wolf. Uh, it's a bad person that's come in. So he was teaching in their synagogues and they were so shocked with all of this. They said, is this not the carpenter's son in verse 55? He only had common schooling, common education. And they said, we know him. His mother's called Mary. We know his brother, the brothers, in verse 55. And it mentions his sisters, Jesus' sisters in 56 and 57. It goes on. Isn't this a prophet or who is this? But we, we talked about that a little bit before as well, so I don't want to linger too long there. Okay, uh, going on. I want chapter 18 now. Turn with me to chapter 18. There's lots of red letters in all of these chapters that I'm going by. Some we've covered before. Some I may come back to. But in chapter 18, there's two spots in here. Chapter 18, verse 12 and through 14. Let's start at verse 12. Chapter 18, verse 12. How think ye, if a man have a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray? These people could understand exactly what he's talking about because they handled animals, they handled sheep. They, their livelihood involved sheep. You had to tend for them. You had to med medical things that you had to do for them. You had to shear them. You had to uh, feed them, take them to where there's water and take them where there's good grass to eat and shade when it's needed. But what if he had a hundred sheep and one got away, one walked away? Some disturbance happens, scared the little one or 
whatever, and he, he went away. Doth not he leave the ninety and nine and doth and goeth into the mountains? That's far away places, wild places, bad things can happen, you can fall in the mountains, and seek that which was lost or gone astray. Gone astray. What about people? If you had a hundred people at church and one person went astray, wouldn't you go and fetch him? That's what it's talking about. Go and find that person. Go phone him, telephone him. Nowadays you can use internet, you can use telephone, you can use this and that. But how many times do we actually call that person? Visit with them on the phone. Hear their sorrows and their heartache. Take some time with them. So verse 13 says, And if so be that he findeth, will he not say unto Pardon me. Uh, Verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more over this, more of that sheep, that one, than the ninety and nine which were not gone astray, did not go astray. Wow. So he's loving on this little one. Another place it'll say it lays it on his shoulders. Even so, it is with. It, Pardon me. The King James puts the not sometimes at the end of the sentence, not at the beginning. Even so, is it not the will of your Father, which is in heaven, that one of these little ones should perish? Do you think God would just ignore this little one? No. It's not God's will that one of them would, would perish. Your heavenly Father is in heaven that one of these little ones, so that's why I was talking about little up to this point when it doesn't really say that this was a little one until you get here. There's another place. These stories are retold in other, like uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You might find the same story told, and the, it, instead of just leaving it there, it actually says that he took that little one and put it on his shoulders. That used to be a loving thing. They dro- dro- dra- uh, drape the little animal over the back of their neck that the legs hang down the front and the little animal could look all over the place, see everything, wasn't hurting, was protected and uh, uh, by weight it was pretty balanced so the animal was comfortable with laying there. I used to do that with cats and they loved it. They'd lay across the back of my neck. So we can care for these little ones and bring them back into the fold and, uh, and, and, and return them to safety. So uh, 15 and on is another uh, story that you want to read. But I want to jump down to uh, 23, chapter, uh, same chapter here, chapter 18, and verse 23, and we'll talk about this because it goes down to 35, which is quite a bit for this morning, down the end of the chapter, yeah. So uh, I'm going to go kind of quick here, but hope you can follow me. Uh, in verse 23, there's a paragraph break in my Bible, a little mark saying that this is a new subject. Therefore, is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants? Oh, we've done this one too. Yeah, I'm thinking about which ones we talked about and which ones we didn't. But here this uh, is a story It's well worth reading again if you haven't done it recently. Um, So the uh, verse 24. I'm going to have to read a little more until I kind of get the story settled in my mind. And when he had begun to reckon, so he's going to take a reckoning of money and value and how the people behave, and he's adding it up, thinking about it. One was brought unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents. Oh, yeah. So I just, I needed to get about that far, and now the rest of the story opens up to me. So this one owes 10,000 talents. I don't care what a talent is worth, not really, except that it's a lot of money. And 10,000 is a lot of numbers, right? This is quite a valuable debt, you might say. And so the master uh, of this, the certain king, He said, uh, you know, you owe me a lot of money and you're going to be sold 
If you can't pay, you're going to be sold as a slave, your wife and children also, until all is paid. No mercy in that verse. You know, sometimes we need to hear that because when we're talking about, this is a a picture of the Heavenly Father. He can be strong-willed. God does. If you read the Old Testament, there's a lot of places where God is very strong to defend or to make things right. Well, all is going to have to be paid. That servant therefore fell down and worshipped him. The servant realized how bad off he was and how strong the Heavenly Father was. He's nothing. The servant has no no ability to pay. He just, just doesn't have it. He's begging now. He's down on his knees. He's laying down in front of this uh, servant, this master, I should say, this master, king, it says there in the verse 23. Uh, and he pleads his case. He begs. And the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion. Can the heavenly father have compassion? Sure he does. It's been many times when you're reading in the Old Testament and the story goes that away. They go, oh boy, they're in trouble now. And they beg for mercy. They beg for help. And God uh, makes sure that there's mercy dealt out to them and uh, compassion is dealt out to them. So he says, okay. And he forgave him the debt. 10,000? Was that what it said? 10,000 in the last words of verse 23. All of this debt... Tremendous debt. He forgives him. And that servant went out and found one, that fellow servant, that owed him a hundred pence, pennies, coins, something small. A hundred against 10,000 that he owed. Was he merciful? No. Shame on him. Grabbed him by the throat in verse 28 said, pay me all that you owe me. That wasn't what the master did for him, what the king did for him. That servant fell down, the same as the first guy, and he besought him and have patience with me and I'll pay you all of it. And he said, oh, no, I won't. And he would not, in verse 30, and went and cast him in prison until all the debt, so, so, so pay all the debt. He said, I'm, I'm going to put you in prison and you're, until it gets... Who's going to pay? He's going to have to beg his relatives. He's going to have his wife working for somebody. He's going to have children in slavery to raise money for him. This is an awful situation. So when his fellow servants saw the other servants of the same king begin to see what's going on. They saw mercy over here and lack of mercy over there. Harshness and miserableness. They went and told their master, their Lord. Then his Lord, after he had called him, said unto him, Thou wicked servant. You know, when we come to the end of our life, we're hoping for thou good and faithful servant. You know, oh, no, this isn't going to work. A wicked servant. I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Because of the, your, your pleading and... and uh, a good justice and good uh, uh, mercy and so on. He said, I forgave you it all. I had compassion. In verse 33, shouldest not thou also have had compassion unto thy fellow servant? You're both servants. This word servant is kind of a nicety. It's really a slave. Somebody was putting servant in in places where it should have been slave. They couldn't leave. They had to do whatever their master told them. Um, This is really slavery. And when it says that we're a servant of Jesus Christ, we need to wake up, think that one through. How valuable is our service to Jesus Christ? How much are we willing to do for Jesus? We know he's compassionate. Anyway, verse 34, and his Lord... Sometimes I watch for that, his Lord, when you think, well, surely they're not anymore. They've been broken off. But and his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors. We don't know what that is, whether he got lashes or what. Until all, till till he should pay all that was due to the master. 
Wow. Let's not get on that side of the uh, of the corrections. We want to be on the mercy side and the uh, and the compassion side. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Boy, you walk up to the place where you're going to pray. You going to remember this verse? You're hoping God's going to forgive you because you're going to pray, forgive me and, and save my life and so on. And we know that the scripture that follows that says that unless you forgive your neighbor, then how is this matching? You're not doing what the master would like you to do. It's not going to work. Something's different there. So we need to think about that. And then there's, there's other parables that Jesus tells that if we match them up, you begin to see, aha, uh -huh. We need to be full of compassion and service to our, our master. So now I want to go to uh, chapter uh, 20. Oh, we did chapter 20, because or that one that I had marked in there. The whole chapter 20. <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, all the way from, from verse 1 to 16, at least. And then 21 uh, has one or two verses here in chapter 21, verse 28. 21, verse 28. So some of these we've already covered, and some I will be covering by talking in Matthew, or I already talked about it in, in Mark, and so on. So uh, right now I'm in uh, chapter uh, 21, and verse 28. 28. And I just have here just... Uh, a few verses, let's see, to 32, 28 to 32. So 28 first in chapter 21, 21, verse 28. But what think ye? Yeah, we need to put our thinking caps on when we're listening and, and understanding Jesus' terms and reading his. But here he's saying a certain man had two sons. I'm kind of thinking that we had talked some about this, but let's take it fairly easy this time as well. And uh, he came to the first and asked, son, go work today in my vineyard. That's, fathers can ask that. That's a normal thing. And he, that would be the son, uh, and he answered and said, I will not. Oh, no, this is not good. You can just tell it already. This is not a good thing to be saying that to your dad. Honor thy father and thy mother. Oh, this is not a good thing. But afterwards he repented and went. Oh, very good. We'd say he smartened up, you know. <laughs> he grew up all of a sudden. Something really happened. And he went and worked in the field. Okay, verse 30. And he came to the second son and said likewise. And he answered, and said, I go, sir, and he went not. Well, that is not right. He was lying. That's the first big one, right? Thou shalt not lie. <laughs> Tell falsehoods. Um, no, no liar is going to be in the kingdom. Um, so he said, I go. And that was, he was not intending to go. And he even used the word sir, you know, to uh, make his dad feel good, I guess. And, uh, and he went not. He did not go. So here's Jesus going to ask a question. Whether, which ones, of them, twain, of the two of them, did the will of his father? Anybody should be able to answer that. You see? So Jesus had a parable here that everybody could see through this parable and understand the situation. Uh, and uh, uh, they said unto him, the first, well, the first son, what they figured. Anyway, then uh, uh, I lost my place here. Um, the first, okay. And then Jesus said unto them, so he's going to get back at them. He's going to uh, give them another little insight to this. Verily I say unto you that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. He was talking to religious leaders, religious people. And he said, 
you know, the same story is happening out in real life. He said, there's people that you call bad, the publicans. You call them bad. The harlots, they are bad. And they're going to be going into the kingdom of God before you. Not a good idea. You better shape up. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. That's John the Baptist that came and told you that things are changing. The kingdom of God is at hand. And, and he said, go and repent before you come. You know, go and check this out. Understand what repentance is before you come and repent. And uh, boy, but the publicans and the harlots believed him, John the Baptist. They were catching on. And ye, when ye had seen it, repented not. You saw what he was doing. You saw that he was the forerunner for Christ, forerunner for something really big that's coming. And you wouldn't. You repented not. Afterwards, the, uh, afterward, that ye might believe him. They didn't want to be known that they believed John the Baptist. So that's a, it's kind of a shocker statement there to get people's attention, bring them back to what's real. So that's just two, uh, or a few verses, or four verses. So I don't want to jump ahead again. We need to make sure that we're doing the right thing here. Uh, I know I've covered uh, the next one down, and then I want to go to uh, Matthew 22. Matthew 22. Okay, and uh, start with verse 2. The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son. They used to have big meals. In Canada, they did that too. And you have a, a wedding, there was always a big meal that went with the wedding. And uh, so here, they, when they're talking about a king made a, a wedding uh, for his son. And he sent forth his servants and called them uh, to call them that were bidden. So they already had a wedding notice out there. They had already been told that it was coming uh, to come to the wedding and they would not come. That's embarrassing. I'm trying, you know, I, I can see this in our, in our world that we live in. Somebody invites you and then you don't go. I mean, that's, uh, that's pretty bad news. The... Uh, uh, so And he sent forth his servants to call them, and they would not come. Again, he sent forth other servants to tell them, which were bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fatlings I've killed, and he's made everything's made ready. And verse 5, and they made light of it. So, so he killed the fatted animal. I don't care. It's up to him. He can kill it if he wants. You can see what you can make light of the subject. I'm not going to go if I don't want to go. They're making light of it. So the uh, in verse five there, um, and went, went their way. They they went off and did their own thing. One to his farm. They said, "Okay, forget it. I'm I'm out of here. I'm busy." And the story is told again in, in another place with this same idea. And it's interesting to catch the difference between this telling of this story and a very, very similar story. But anyway, this guy went to his farm and another one went to his merchandise that he was buying and selling. And the remnant, the rest of the people, uh, took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. Get out of here, you miserable. You know, they uh, they didn't want to hear this meal was being offered. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth. He was angry because the way they treated his servants and the way he he thought he was a pretty good uh, benevolent person and made a meal for everybody. And they just made light of it. And he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers. That's what they were. They killed his, uh, slew them. They were murderers. And he burnt up their city. You read in the Old Testament of things that were done with the cities of people that fought against the Heavenly Father and so on. Uh, boy, and this is just Jesus just telling what they already knew about their own history. 
Then said he unto his servants, that's the king that's making this wedding, man, certain king, yes, it's this king, um, heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies, destroyed the their, their, their murderers, and he said unto them in verse 8, then said he to his servants, the wedding is ready. Now what are we going to do? Everything's sitting out on the table, the plates, the silver, the bowls. Everything's ready. The wedding is ready. But they which were bidden were not worthy. Glad we didn't have them here. You know, they're not worthy. Verse 9. Go ye therefore into the highways. Another place says highways and byways. You know, and bring people in. And as many as ye shall find, bid them to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways to gather together all that, as many as they found, both the good, bad, and the good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. Brought anybody. The other telling of this story is just a touch different, right? And this story has a little bit more here that you need this, this uh, lesson learned. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man which had not on a wedding garment. Some people say, oh, you come as you are. God takes everybody. Now, wait a minute. They didn't read this verse. This guy didn't have on a wedding garment. What does that mean? It's pretty easy to translate very quickly, you know, in thought, that there's certain clothing that you'd wear when you'd go to see a king. You went to a very fancy house, a very fancy uh, place. People were wearing fancy clothing. You'd put on your best, and that's all that God wants. Uh, Pearl and I talk about it quite often. When we were young, we had one pair of shoes. We polished it every Friday <laughs> so that we could wear it to church. One pair of shoes or something similar in Pearl's home and my home. Um, we wore blue jeans all the time. Well, we take our very best ones, not the ones that are all scuffed or change color and so on. You wore your best to go to church. Where we're getting it from, this idea. You put on your best. Didn't have to be suit, but we had clean clothes. We had better clothing, and that we wore, wore socks, <laughs> wore shoes. Around home, we pretty well always went barefoot. That was the attire of the day. But here we'd put on something better. And he said unto him, this is the king saying to him, friend, now that's nice words. So he was not harsh with him. He just said, friend, how comest thou in hither, in here, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. So the guy that was wrong in this situation actually had better at home. He knew what he could have put on, and he didn't. Something there is, the onus is on the man that came with the wrong garment. We need to pay attention, I guess. So when we're doing the Lord's work and we walk up to somebody and you know, knock on their door or meet them on the grass or something, we need to meet them in a certain way that represents Jesus Christ. We don't all, you know, a mechanic doesn't wear a suit. <laughs> uh, we, we all have a, a, a garment that's to do with our work or our, our things that we're involved in. And, uh, you know, you don't wear a suit to mow your grass. But we need to come to church with the best that we have. Then said the king unto the servants, bind him hand and foot and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few chosen. We're called to the, to the uh, feast. But are we paying attention to what's going on around us? Are we realizing what kind of a person we're meeting? and What kind of a king do we have? What, what is our Heavenly Father like? What does he dislike? What's Jesus' love and what is Jesus' ways? We need to have that in mind. That's what we really should be getting from this. And the alternative, the alternate, 
would be to be bound and thrown into outer darkness. We got to value our system. We got to understand where we're at in our world and what we're doing for the Lord and what we ought to be doing for the Lord. Um, we don't want to fall into this situation where we have to be thrown out, put out. Many of Jesus' parables would say, "Don't when you go into a place like that, don't take the highest chair, because somebody higher in value to the one putting on the program." would say, well, you come down, sit here, and this person, oh, you come up and sit over here. That's embarrassing. Well, don't go into that. Don't get into that situation. Take the, take the lower position, and if everybody is seated, and well, here, come on up here. You, you should be up here. That is a blessing and honor, right? That's how we need to view serving the Heavenly Father. It's an honor to serve Heavenly Father. And it's an honor to, to be there. So I better um, quit while I'm ahead, <laughs> as the saying goes. But um, I just uh, marked you. This is 22, uh, 22, and this is the wedding banquet. Okay. And then the next one after this, uh, we actually did cover. So I won't have to uh, go into that one. And then next time when we come back, we're going to have the faithful versus the wicked. And uh, another one after that is the sheep and the goats. When you're told you, you go on this side and you go on this side. And why is there a division? Why did they get to go on the right side or the left side? Or why were they called the sheep and the goats? It's in the story. So we'll get there. <laughs> okay, I want to intrigue you to read the scriptures, enjoy them, see the, the excitement that's there, and may God bless you.